Our generation ship was to travel hundreds of years across the stars so we could build a new world for humanity. We had tried to restore Earth's ravaged ecology. The desperate solution nearly wiped us out instead. And now it's on the ship. And it's growing. There are only a few thousand of us left and we cannot repeat the past. In our ship's closed ecosystems, resources are finite. Nothing can go to waste. Every bit of scrap needs to be salvaged, reclaimed and repurposed into what we need to survive. Materials, food, water, air. We might not always work well with each other. We might squabble, we might stumble, but we are all we have. As we're building a balanced ecosystem, years will go by like minutes. We must adapt to each other and to the unknown. We're not just learning to build a sustainable future. Everyone on board is living their own story. And your story will be different from mine. Can we escape the mistakes that drove us from our home? Because every decision we make now will determine if humanity earns a second chance. Uh, so what you just saw was the trailer for Generation Exile. It's the game that we've been working on for... Wow. Well, you've been working on it for a while. <laughs> I've been working on it for about three or so years now. Yeah. Um, and it's why the momentum on the channel has been relatively slow in that period <laughs> of time. Um, but a lot of the stuff that has happened on this game has actually made its way onto the channel, which we can talk a little bit about later. Oh, yeah. um, but I'm joined here by Nels Anderson, who is the game director at oh. Sondola Studios and game director on... Uh, Generation Exile. Oh, hi, Matt. <laughs> hi, Nels. <laughs> um, yeah, would you like to just sort of introduce yourself a little bit? Um, yeah. And then we can talk about what we're going to talk about. Yeah, I'd love, I love to talk about the making of a video game. Um, yeah, I mean, as mentioned, my name is Nels. I've been uh, making this game for, uh, you could argue, between five and six years. Um, and then before that, I worked at a number of other uh studios here in Vancouver, um, Clay Entertainment, and Hothead before that. I was also part of Campo Santo. Uh, we were kind of sort of remote, um, unlike Sandra List, which is a fully remote, we are fully even though remote. you and I are in the same physical <laughs> city along with two other folks. There's a bunch yeah. of people in other places. We thought about doing this remotely, well. and I was like, no, we should just yeah, talk about it. We're, we're literally... There are a lot of upsides to being an entirely remote organization, um, but occasionally being able to leverage the fact that at least... Yeah. Uh, a subset of us are in the same physical location is nice. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so basically, I think it'd be fun to just do a video post-announcement now that we can actually talk about the thing. Um, firstly, kind of just going into your history a little bit. Because mm -hmm. I think my audience would love to know um, about sort of getting into games. You know, most people watching are already in the games industry, but maybe they're trying to become designers or directors or whatever, mm. and they're trying to figure out like how to do it, right, in the way that we're doing yeah. it. And um, so I think just like, you know, us going into a bit of your background, like mm -hmm. you said, going into clay, yeah. et cetera, and then some of the projects you've worked on could be a really interesting conversation. And then towards the later half of this, we could talk about Generation X. We'll talk about that cool in video game. Intricate detail, um, <laughs> because that's our job now. <laughs> it's true. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, so I can start at like mm. the edu education component, I guess. Um, so my background is entirely technical. Like I have two degrees in computer science. Uh, Do you think they're important? Yeah, Because I don't. Well, so there's a difference, right? So there's a difference between like important and essential. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in Wyoming in the middle of nowhere. Like genuinely, I honestly had to walk up a snowy hill after school most of the year. Um, and you know, I was going to high school in like the 90s and stuff right uh i graduated high school in 2001 so like the internet was the thing you got on with a dial-up modem mm -hmm. and i lived in a, a town of like 10,000 people in the county so like programming a computer that was like i guess i could have gone to like the public library and maybe checked out I don't, right. I don't know, like, the Kernahan and Richie, like, C programming book or whatever, but, like... You that can teach all, yourself. No, that yeah. all seemed, like, entirely beyond me, right? Uh -huh. um, and so I didn't know... Like, I was like, well, whatever. I, I, as, a, as, a, as a youth, I had a subscription to PC Gamer, so I, 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 <laughs> I had many, many years with that magazine. Uh, things come full circle. It's wild. Um, the... Um, 
So I knew that like, okay, yes, technically there are people with names who make these video games, but that was like never, mm-hmm. never a thing that I thought I would like be accessible to me vocationally at all, right? Um, but when I finished undergrad and, and was figuring out what to do when it came to university, I was like, well, I like computers. And that was it. So I just like enrolled in computer science at the University of Colorado. Um, and despite the fact that I had like, you know, whatever, I had maybe made like a crappy X-Files GeoCities fan site, but I had like never meaningfully programmed anything ever. Um, fortunately, I guess I just like had an aptitude for it and it was fine. Um, and so the, the, the structured like learning of university and having like a solid grounding in programming as like, I don't know, a craft or whatever, um, was very valuable. Right. Right. Um, is it the only way? Like, absolutely not. Right. Right. But I do think there is something, there is value in both, you know, having to do, having the opportunity to do like a broad survey of the entire, you know, discipline as Mm -hmm. it were right like every once in a while i have to knock the dust off some shit from like the networking class i did in third year or or whatever right right um right and then also you know in in parallel uh i got a degree in philosophy well that one is certainly um a lot less uh Mm -hmm. vocationally valuable Mm -hmm. like being able to have a broader you know, interest in just like things that exist in the world and right. not like, I have only played video games and I love video games. Video games are great. Now I will make a video games. Um, that diversity, particularly as like a creative professional, whatever, um, is also very valuable. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I think that like also, <laughs> I mean, there, there's also, you know, obviously an exchange between uh, value and cost, right? Um, I got lucky where my parents split up when I was quite little, but my dad had been living in Colorado for quite a long time and thus, you know, paying Colorado state income taxes. Okay. And thus I was able to say, well, because my father lives in Colorado, mm-hmm. uh, I get in, this is not a thing in the UK or here in Canada, but in mm-hmm. the States, um, the disparity between in-state tuition and out-of-state tuition mm-hmm. is outrageous. Interesting. Okay. Uh, like, Comically, so you, so you get cheaper education if you're from the state that the, uh, the university Again, is in. by like huh. five to ten x if it's a public yeah. university, right? Okay. Um, so that meant that like I was able to go relatively cheaply. Yeah, like I took on some else. loans and I was right. an RA for three of the four years, so like my cheaply housing was covered. And so, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I was able to roll out of there with like some, but not like crushing education debt. Right. right. So okay. the, the calculus is very different if it's like you will assume six figures of debt. It's like, no one should do that. The fact that that's possible is, in fact, many ways, like, deeply unethical. Yeah. Um, (laughs) But yeah, so then when when I... But even then, through undergrad, like, you know, again, I had some, like, in the back of my head notion that, like, oh, if you know how to program, maybe you can make a video game. But, you know, um, Denver, like, the University of Colorado is in Boulder, which is, like, just outside of Denver, so it's, like, Mm Denver-ish. Denver wasn't really, like, a huge game dev hub Mm -hmm. like there were a few particularly back in you know like 2003 2005 there were like a few companies on like two or three um but it's still not really a thing that felt like in reach per se Mm -hmm. um and when i was finishing uh undergrad i was like strongly considering going into law enforcement um i almost did an internship with the fbi (laughs) um Maybe influenced by the X Files, um, <laughs> but doing like the angle would be like digital forensics, blah, yeah, blah, blah, yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah, right? I mean, it's the stuff that like as game devs you're interested in, like solving interesting problems, yeah, right, right? Right, right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that was it. Like my background was filmmaking for very much the same reason. Right? Mm-hmm, like when mm-hmm. I went to university, I partly it kind of ties into what you were talking about with the the, the not just focusing on development, but like. I did media production rather than like film studies because that broadly gave me a lot of different skills in a lot of different places, which thankfully has turned into being able to make YouTube videos. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Um, But I'm grateful that I did that for the same sort of reasons that you get that. And yeah, the reason why I picked that in the first place Mm -hmm. was because telling stories through movies was the same kind of kick that I get from solving problems, you know, solving problems on a film set or or production or whatever is the same as game dev. I found, I fell into game dev Mm -hmm. Um, while I was at university doing film mm-hmm. um, for that reason of like, oh, I can do this on my own. Mm-hmm. And 
uh, I enjoy that curiosity where versus the film there were so many other things that can go wrong along the way before you even start making a movie that like it, you know, that struggle there when it was just like oh I can go down and the, the draw right? <laughs> plus also being able to meet people who made video games and just realizing yeah. there's such a like friendly community mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, especially in the UK where kind of everybody knows everybody mm-hmm. back then right um, so yeah I, to- I totally get that yeah um, um, so yeah I was briefly flirting with you know like am I going to do this infosec thing and there were a number of places uh, that offered like a graduate master's program mm-hmm. in like kind of an infosec thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but just as a lark, I applied to a handful of those and then just also the University of British Columbia. Okay. Uh, which didn't offer, obviously, offer that program, but I, I had a bunch of friends in Seattle. So I've been up to Seattle a bunch. I really like the Pacific Northwest. Um, and so when it came to getting the various grad school acceptances, blah, 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 the place I got into that were like notable was um, Johns Hopkins, which is in Baltimore. Uh, Purdue, which is in West Lafayette, Indiana, Carnegie Mellon, which is in Pittsburgh, right. and then the University of British Columbia. And I'm like, well, those are all equally good universities. Blah, blah, blah. Where do I want? I'm like, but where do I want to live? Uh, but, 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 I guess I'm moving to Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> no shade to anyone who lives in any of those cities, but um, not for me. No, thank you. Vancouver is a special uh, beast of itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's so real it's good. Just, it's pretty great. Um, so I came up here and I was like, I guess I'm, maybe I'm going to be an academic. I don't know. And then after like six months of grad school, I'm like, no, nah, never mind. That's not, that's not what I want. It's not for me. Um, but I was already, you know, in the pipe. So I was like, okay, well, I'll finish this master's degree, whatever. And then I'll figure out, God, what am I going to do? Um, and by sheer coincidence, the year I moved up here was the first year that the Penny Arcade Expo happened in Seattle. And it packs West. Yeah, well, this was back when there, there was, was just a, a PAX. Penny Arcade Expo. It was just, right. it was just the Penny Arcade Expo. Right, it was just right. the one in Seattle. And it wasn't even technically in Seattle. The first, I think the first three were at a much smaller venue okay. in Bellevue called the Maidenbauer Center. Um, and so it was just like, you know, I happened to move up there like, uh, like three weeks before the first PAX. I was like, oh, whatever, it's right there. It's just over the border. I'll go check it out. Mm-hmm. And it was very cool. Um, the next year, I volunteered as like one of the enforcers, like the volunteer con staff yeah, thing, yeah. like the the, um, the CAs at GDC. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and in doing that, met a ton of exhibitors, like people who do make a video game professionally. Mm-hmm. And of course, because it's so proximal, a ton of them are from Vancouver. Right. And then I started to actually meet people who really did this in the city yeah. so that then when I was finishing grad school, I could just like send an email to a bunch of people who I'd known and just be like, yo, uh, maybe I want to do this actually. Um, and that's where the, the path kind of started to like, you know, seem as like, oh, no, this is a thing that people I know, peers like actually do. Okay, this is tenable and not like a thing for people who are in magazines but like not right. normal people, right? Right, right. And so you went from like how did you how did you go from where you were then studying what you were studying in uh, at the, at uh, UBC into mm-hmm. sort of your first kind of game dev right. job. Um so <laughs> uh I the University of British Columbia their grad program they have one of these in undergrad as well where um you can opt into this mentorship thing where you're paired with like a senior student as well oh, interesting okay um and usually someone from academia and it just happened to be the case that um the person who was my like senior student no he was the industry person because he already graduated yeah um like the industry person was some dude who oh, he worked at apple like a, or a company here in town that got acquired by apple right. but one of the other people in his class um did do game stuff at a mm-hmm. place here in town called Slant Six. Um, so he put me in touch with, and this is how all game stuff works. He put me in touch with that guy. At that guy, I met someone else at a at like a party at that dude's place. Okay. And like, as all the shindigs here happen to be, it's just a ton of industry people. Yeah, I think that's the that's the thing that's hardest to communicate to people trying to get into the games industry. Like, it's different in the U- in the UK. You, the UK is so small that it is the same as like just meeting people it's, it's harder in in the west i think and like in in america mm. but in the uk there's like three game events that happen right. every year yeah and so you just go to one of those right. and you've met everybody like the majority <laughs> of people were right. getting to get your foot in the door yeah, yeah. you go to those and you know you're a decent person and mm-hmm. you're just there to make friends mm-hmm. and like yeah. you're not clear. yeah it's not like obviously like transactional yeah, like, exactly. like like scraping for job yeah, yeah. Right. don't do that Never no do that. <laughs> um it's not good but yeah it's the, that's the thing so i, I was curious how like that 
to me, that's a different parallel because, like, we've always spoken about this. Is you're just like you know everyone. I'm like, no, I know everyone in the in the UK <laughs> games industry because right. you just do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whereas, yeah. like, yeah, in 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 sort of America, it seems a lot harder because mm-hmm. there's less. That you know, they're much more spread out. Yeah. Um. So it must be a bit more challenging for people. But would you? you know, what advice would you give? to people trying to get in if they are just starting for instance and need to meet people like is it just go to events wherever you can yeah that kind of is it right yeah and just like you know be curious and like yeah don't be transactional right like there's a there's a huge gulf between like you know student or recent grad who's like very clearly seeing you as like opportunity for job versus like oh someone who just like thinks the thing that we're all interested in is like genuinely interesting and like just wants to talk about it and that one is like oh okay that's like you know that's not this weird transactional thing right um that matters a lot and that was i mean like obviously it wasn't super considered at the time but i think that like when I started connecting with people here in the local scene. And I think that is another thing that is like, it's not nothing. Um, Being somewhere where there yeah, is a scene. Yeah. Yeah. It, I feel the same way. I think, I think if you're serious about it, mm-hmm. you need to be, I mean, it's why I picked Vancouver when, mm-hmm. I, when I was looking to escape from the UK, <laughs> which we won't go into I, that story. I mean, it's, you can put two or two together there. It rhymes with Hexit. <laughs> um, but when, when I chose that, right, I'd never been to Canada and um, I knew uh, Jake Burkett, mm. who um, had makes a great game called Regency Solitaire. You should go. You should play those. Um, I think he just launched the second one. That's a relatively recently. Yeah, yeah. relatively recently. So go buy that if you're inter- interested in sort of puzzle games. Um, but yeah, he um, was talking about his stint in Vancouver and was mm-hmm. saying how great it was. And I was like, well, that's a recommendation. Plus, it's the warmest place, and there seems to be a good seen here yeah, yeah and so that is literally why i picked here and why i probably mm-hmm. am you know that's how we've ended up yeah working yeah, yeah. together right and so. that, then there's so much of that stuff is just like it's just like normal organic yeah, connections precisely yeah um yeah. yeah and that was you know uh a similar i mean for me like i'd met some you know at these various shindigs i'd met somebody but also when i graduated and this is a this is something you have familiarity with um uh my student visa was about to expire mm, and to mm. stay in the country i need to get a job real quick mm-hmm. and uh as you know at that point i was very interested in doing game stuff and having met people through pax and like other local industry stuff it was like okay this seems tenable and i like i probably know enough about both video games and programming to be able to be like at least kind of useful mm-hmm. um but still, those wheels grind very slowly. Yeah. Uh, so I just had to take a job that would be a job. So mm-hmm. I was not deported. Uh, and I ended up working for some web startup that was doing, like, mobile streaming video stuff. And again, this was in, like... Before it was a thing. It was This yeah. was genuinely in, like, 2007. Yeah, yeah. The just, I, as you, the, just as YouTube was... Correct. Like the iPhone didn't exist. <laughs> yeah. um, it was quite novel. For a, a brief, weird period of time, I might have been the most experienced Microsoft Silverlight dev in all of Canada. Oh, Silverlight. Because it might have been only me. <laughs> I remember Silverlight. Oh, yeah. my gosh. That's wow. a name I haven't heard in a yeah. long well, time. Netflix. Netflix was built on Silverlight. That's why I know it. Oh, when you used to watch yeah. Netflix in your browser, the like first few right. versions of Netflix, it would, uh, like... You'd have to have Silverlight installed. Yeah. And that was a similar thing where, like, as as is their want, Microsoft was, like, giving people a bunch of money to, right. like, build stuff using Silverlight. That sounds familiar. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Um, and it was, like, whatever. It was fine. It was... Right. It was... It, there were things to learn there, even though it was quickly very obvious that yeah. it was, like, oh, this is not... This is not what I want to be doing. Um... But it also obviously provided a path via the uh, British Columbia's provincial nominee program um, to just have a perm- permanent residency here in Canada. Right. And as soon as that paperwork came through, I'm like, cool, guys, uh, I'm out video games, bye. And at that point, you know, I continued to meet various people, go to ver- various events, and it was yeah. just someone who, who I'd actually um, uh, would eventually come back to later. Uh, my first industry gig was at Clay Entertainment here in town, okay. very briefly, <laughs> uh, at the time, Clay was working with Nexon, like the Kurt Ryder, Maple Story, that Nexon. Mm-hmm. Um, they were not like owned by Nexon or anything like that, but Nexon was offering the publishing of a like at the time again relatively novel, like free to play kind of sort of Smash Brothersy type okay. brawler. Um, and then uh, two months, and I think one and a half weeks after I started, uh, Nexon. Close this the like Nexon branch studio in Vancouver. Right, that was the place that Clay was liaising with. Right, and so all their publishing and everything just like disappeared. Mm. And while like 
Clay didn't go away. Yeah. Um, their main source of like operating revenue did, and is the most recent hire. I was then like, well, the by, the belt must be tightened. I'm sorry. Goods buy. Uh. Uh, fortunately, um, I was able to reach out to someone who I'd known at a different game studio here in town through PAX, uh, at Hothead Games, and I was like, hey, um. I'm unexpectedly looking for a job. Do you guys need... And they just happen to be like, actually, we do need a gameplay programmer for this thing. And <laughs> did you... So because of that connection, would you say it was easier to get your foot... Like, because you just happened to know... Tremendously. From, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, Right. Yeah. And, like, and it was, like, in no way a freebie, right? right? It's the kind of thing where it's like, you know, I still obviously had to, like, go through a bunch of interviewing mm -hmm. and, like talk about what I was interested in, what I could do, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But it was just the kind of thing where it's like, you know, oh, instead of just like your resume goes into a giant slush pile of yeah, resumes, you, you it's like, to that oh, resume. someone yeah. will actually take a look at it and be like, right. can this person do it? Yeah. Um, yeah, because I mean, you have that advantage, right? If you've got that personal connection, there's something, uh, a friend to me said a long time ago, is it, it, there's a common concept of like the path of least resistance. Mm. It's like, yes, there's obviously things you're looking for when you're looking to hire somebody, but half of the time too is it's like how you're going to fit on a team. Mm -hmm. And if, if you are already familiar with most of the team mm -hmm. um, and you can fulfill that job, my mm -hmm. personal experience has always been that like that's a, and even in interviewing other people, right? Like that's, that's way way more likely to get yeah huge get difference yeah because huge of difference. that level of familiarity as yeah, well yeah. as you know obviously you need to be able to do what you're saying correct you do yeah. but if if it's you versus another candidate that they don't know very well they're way mm -hmm. more likely to pick you because yeah. you've already got that like if you can if you have working language with with other mm -hmm. uh, team members already yeah. just by you know getting to know them mm -hmm. i think that is like weirdly yeah it, it sucks that it is that way sometimes but um, it's kind of just one of those things about working in a project-based industry, I think, as well. Yeah, totally. Okay, so you then started work at Hothead. Yep, I was a Hothead for... Was that, so programming? Yep. Okay. It, was, it was like gameplay programming, so it was very um, player-facing, right? It wasn't mm -hmm. like deep, like, gotta, yeah, gotta, so gotta make this system. shader, right? Like, so I started off in the most classical way, hooking up a bunch of UI, UI. stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that checks um, out. Um, so was this their own engine? Uh, yes. Okay. So um, Hothead was using uh, basically a fork of the Torque engine, which was like, I don't even remember who made it. They were doing, um, it was sprite-based stuff, right? Uh, no, it was, it was 3D. 3D? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, the uh, at the time they were making. Funnily enough, they were making the Penny Arcade game. I didn't work on that oh, one. Oh yeah, okay. But then yeah, yeah, yeah. the thing that I was on was Ron Gilbert, like right. of Monkey Island. Ron Gilbert. That was the first one of the first serious interviews I ever had. That was weird. Um, As a fan of Monkey Island, correct. Yeah. It was. I was like, I remember playing this game with my friends when I was like ten years old. I hope I don't come across as a weird guy, and it was fine. Um, <laughs> Uh, it turns out that Ron is like actually a, a, a very like old school and extremely experienced programmer. Mm -hmm. And so like that thing was very resonant. But mm -hmm. so Hothead was using Torque, but for um, uh, the Penny Arcade and some other stuff they did. But the game I was working on, which was Death Spank, was actually an engine that Ron had made. Okay. Which was largely a like modernization, recreation, derivation, whatever, of the Scum engine <laughs> that was used for like Maniac Mansion. Right. And yeah. the Monkey Islands and, like, a bunch of those classic LucasArts right. graphic adventure stuff. I remember um, like, uh, Ron did uh, one of the, like, classic games, GDC Porse Morgan yeah. things a few years ago. And he showed a bunch of script, like, like code script mm -hmm. from Maniac Mansion. I was like, wait a minute. That all... I know exactly what that is. Because, like, the scripting language he'd yeah. written was, like, custom. And it, but it had a similar, like, you know, object, verb, interaction, use thing. And I was mm -hmm. like, that's... Oh, it was just... It was just Maniac Mansion the whole time. <laughs> um, Interesting. And so was that? Was that like what? What language was it? It was just. It was a scripting language. Which is literally his own scripting he language. Had invented. Okay. Yeah. And it was like Interesting. R right. had written a compiler for it that then compiled it down into you know like C plus plus. But I was mainly in that like custom. It it wasn't scum, but it was like basically scum. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was, it was like you know relatively resemblant to something like a Lua. Lua, or a I was going to ask. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. So was it was that the, was that the biggest challenge? Was just learning that language? Mm, yeah, I mean, but I mean, you had the guy that created it exactly, right? right? So, yeah. And it was like you know, it's a scripting language. It's not that gnarly. And mm -hmm. I've been doing like lots of programming for you know, oh god, like 
like eight years at that point. Mm -hmm. So like that part wasn't that gnarly. It was more like, oh, this is the first like, because I'd only been at Clay for like two and a half months, right? right? Um, This was like the first like, oh, actual project. You know, it's like showed up. I'd say probably about the time, like, in the same state the game was in when, like, you rolled on to Gen Exile, mm-hmm. where it's like, okay, there's, like, the, like, hazy outline of a game here, but it's, like, pretty vague, right? So, like, the biggest challenges were just figuring out, like, just how how a game production project go at all, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, in a similar, it's a pretty small team fashion, being like, oh, like, no one's going to really tell you what to do. Too. Yeah, like there's like okay, we're trying to fi- like complete this part of the game. Okay, and to do that, okay, well we're gonna like there's gonna be these enemies and they need to have an AI and then there'll be this boss and blah blah blah. But that's kind of like it. Yeah, and so you just have to like you just oh own it. You just, you just have it. to figure it out and just like do it. And obviously, yeah. like you know the team was supported. It was it was it was a pretty pleasant team to be on. You know, people were offering like assistance and everything, right. but it wasn't like a oh okay yes. Yeah, so this design beat to the beat exactly. Yeah, it was yeah. like nah, there was a lot of right. just like figure out, and that's that was the gameplay programmingness of it, right? Whereas right. like it was very player facing, and there wasn't like okay, well you know this ability needs to kind of like sort of work like this, yeah. uh, but there's so much in that like you know programming is the last mile of design as like right. an aphorism, which is I think quite accurate, right? Because yeah. like. All those small changes from, like, you know, like, well, how does the targeting of this ability work? And, like, how does it, does it, like, require, you know, some amount of frames to be active, or is it active instantly? Does it have yeah. a cool that, like, all those decisions that, you know, okay, whatever, if you're at, like, um, uh, like, a, like a Ubisoft or something, it's like, okay, well, someone has probably written, like, an incredibly detailed document, like, that's their whole job, to specify, like, exactly how every single one of these things should be, and then these ones should have certain tuning variables and blah, blah, but this was, like, not that. It's like, oh, we need something that basically does this? Go for it. Yeah. And it was, like, a lot of just, like, oh, okay, I just have to figure all this out, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Um, but it was, I think, that's the that's the kind of... Uh, environment that I like to be in and that was where there was like almost from the jump uh, it was like a lot of like implementation but also like design at the same time right of like relatively discrete things right like mm-hmm. things at the level of like enemy AI and character abilities and stuff like that not like what is the entire game but it was still like a lot of just like okay problem design problem like how is how is this gonna feel to play and all that right um and that is where it started, like, oh, okay, design, like, as a practice, domain of responsibility, whatever. Um, I was like, okay, th- yeah, this is a thing that I do have a lot of mm-hmm. interest in. Right. The, the intention is not to be like, actually, I love graphics effects and shaders or whatever, and yeah. I'm going to go hard on, like, that right. domain of programming. It was yeah. it was always, like, being bent toward the Gameplay. player-facing, right. you know. This is, as, makes this, this is close to, like the human being playing the game kind of as possible, uh-huh. right? Uh-huh. Uh, versus, like, closer to the machine where it's like, let's make the rendering go faster or whatever. And so how then did you get from there into becoming the lead designer on... Going back to Clay. Yeah, going back um, to Clay and becoming the lead designer on Mark of the Ninja. Right. Um, so, yeah, so I've, you know, I was at Hothead Ship, two Death Bank games. Initially, it was supposed to be one, and then <laughs> right. it, it got cut in half and made into two separate games. <laughs> um uh, but once that was wrapping up, you know, I'd still stayed in touch with some of the people at Clay periodically, and the the founder, CEO, probably, whatever, like, chief guy um, at Clay, Jimmy Chang, had just reached back out to me because they had uh, shipped a side-scrolling, like, pretty combat-centric game called Shank, yeah. and they had um, a sequel to that in the pipeline, but then they'd also just signed another project, and they're like, oh, we need to staff up on this other project. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how it was... I might have just talked to him about it at some point. Um, that Jamie knew that I was like super into stealth games. Yeah. But I always have been. That's always just been like that's a, your thing. A genre, yeah. subgenre, whatever that I've really enjoyed. Right. Like I Thief, the first Thief will always and forever be like one of those ones that is right. like f- instrumental. Right. Um, so it's emergent stealth stuff too. Then. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, and so yeah, they you know they'd signed like just a just a a pure like animated like pitch but it wasn't like there was no game right. game for ninja it was just kind of like here's like a 90 second video that like the roughly, idea uh, we think it's probably gonna be something like this um and microsoft had greenlit that but it was still pretty like flexible right like it could have at that point it could have gone way more and you know this was what around 2000 
2010. Yeah, around mm-hmm. 2010. So it was like Xbox Live Arcade was a thing that was just starting to like really pop off. Right. Right. Yeah. Um. So yeah, at, at that point, you know, the game since it was only a, a, like a concept video essentially, right? It could have gone way more of just like uh, almost you know resurrection of the nes era like ninja gaiden style where it's just side scrolling obliterating dudes whatever um or and in a way that certainly was perfectly amenable for microsoft take it in the direction that ultimately ended up going that was my interest where it's like what if we just make it like an actual full-on side scrolling stealth game right like in fully in the conventions of your thieves and your metal gears and your tenchus and stuff like that right um and you know the folks at Clay were on board. They're like, sure, why not? Let's, it seems okay. Let's try to do it. And then a year and a half ish later, Ninja came out. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was like 18 months. I'd have to, I'd have to double check and remind myself, but it was that, it was ish right. around that. Yeah. So I think, you know, getting to go from God, that's programming then, which obviously gameplay programs, so you've done some design mm-hmm. work, but then becoming a lead programmer, no, sorry, lead, lead designer. Mm-hmm. Um, on a game like that, like what were the challenges there for you? Oh boy! And then I guess also so many. What do you remember as that process of being like keeping the team motivated throughout the whole thing, right? Because we know how games are made; they kind of mm-hmm. most of the time, unless you know, unless you're making a specific type of game, they kind of suck for a, a long time. Oh yeah! And then they ramp up to being really, really good. Yep. So, <laughs> so you know, what would you say you learn? Oh boy. But being the lead on that project, uh-huh. ultimately. I mean, like you, I don't think you, you weren't game director, right? You were just the lead designer. But, yeah, I mean, like again like, as. You know, as a relatively small indie company, the, like, hierarchy or whatever was not, like, sure. particularly stratified, right? Um, you know, at the at the time, Clay is much bigger now, so I don't know exactly how it is, but at least, like, for my duration there as well as for a while after, all the, like, designers were still, like, very technical. Um, so even though, you know, I was, like, the lead designer, I was still doing a ton of programming, mm-hmm. right? Still, like, a lot of implementation, Um and also, I designed, like, half the levels in that game. Like, it laid out every single tile of collision, placed every dude, and then somebody else, um, Jason Dreger, who was also a very talented designer, who I think is still there, um, he basically did the other half of the level. So it was just the kind of thing where it's, like, just... <laughs> in retrospect, is the kind of thing where it's, like, if I knew how much would have been involved, I probably would have been more intimidated. But it's almost like, you don't... know what you don't yeah, know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, like you don't know that you can't do it, so you just kind of <laughs> sort of stumble, stumble <laughs> forward t- until you figure out how to make it work, I guess. Um, yeah, that I'm sounds the, familiar. The, the, <laughs> right? Uh, like, probably the thing that did assist that is that, like, you know, from the jump, it was really clear to me that the thing was, like, it was meant to be a love letter to all the stealth games that I enjoyed just with, like, <laughs> one dimension removed, right? Um, right. And it was just out of, like, fondness and for those games as like a, a genre or a type or whatever and then trying to be pretty analytical about like how they functioned um that i think let us reverse engineer metaphorically speaking like what about those experiences is compelling right mm-hmm. like what about what about a stealth game is it that like makes it different from like you know just a normal run and gun i'm blasting or stabbing dudes type thing right um and uh, identifying that core loop of like, okay, well, these games are different because fundamentally the pacing of them is like proactive, right? Like most mm-hmm. other, whatever, action adventure broadly, games where you like do a, a combat or a challenge by moving a little guy around a screen, like almost all those is like, okay, the challenge appears, but like it is engaging with you. Yeah. Right? Like, you know, yeah. you got to jump over the pit as Mario or the dudes show up and Nathan Drake has to blast them or whatever. Right? Stealth games are kind of like the weird exception where, like, you are observing this thing and this is, you know, is it form following function or vice versa without the game knowing that you're there, so to speak. Right? So it's like, okay, you're observing what's going on. You're coming up with some kind of like, okay, well, if I, you know, right. break that light, then there'll be shadow over here, and it'll make a noise over here, so yeah. then I can get over there. So it's like, you observe the whatever surroundings, come up with some kind of plan, try to execute on it, and then either it will work, <laughs> or it won't, and then you have to address it, right? Right. But identifying that kind of, like, core 
you know, loop, as it were, of, like, observe, plan, execute, ended up being, like, oh, this is a thing we can keep pointing back to, to be, like, this is ultimately what this game is about. Okay. Right? Yeah. And, like, anything that serves that, yeah. we should move in that direction. Anything right. that doesn't, we should Would move away from those that. three were your goals? Yes. Then, yeah. yeah, yeah. And right. that, like, specific loop, right? Yeah. So things like, um, you know, okay, well, whenever you target some object, we'll just, like, paint on the screen mm -hmm. the radius that the noise from damaging that thing is going to create, right? Because that facilitates the observe and plan part of it because it's like, okay, well, then I know. There isn't, like, this, that was a challenge with a lot of stealth games where it's like... Feedback. Yeah, and it's like, well, if I do this, is that guy going to react this way or that way? Well, try it. Oh, it didn't work. Okay, well, either yeah. I have to, like, hit the quick load button or, like, well, now a guy does know where I am, blah, 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 right? And it's like, okay, well, how can we just facilitate that planning thing so people aren't feeling like they need to guess Right, about the, what's going to go You take the on. randomness away to some exactly. degree. Right. So do, but do you think, do you, I mean, and this is an interesting conversation. Um, I don't want to too far because we've got plenty more to talk about. But <laughs> um, I do think there's probably something there about, um, as a designer, choosing to take that tension away for that specific um, goal, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think if it's, if it's in, in the instance of this, totally understand. But some people may argue that, like, you're taking away some of the randomness, um, which potentially could create other interesting gameplay, you know, outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it really was in service of that, you know, having that, like, three, three and a half yeah. point, like, observe, plan, execute thing where, like, sometimes you still don't pull it off or, right. like, a thing you were expecting to happen is like, oh, yeah, the immediate thing happens, but then the next step in the chain, you, you weren't, okay. oh, God, so now I need to do that, right? But that, like, observing, learning through experimentation, but, and there's still, I think, a lot of, like, you know, challenge and tension there, but it was the kind that we wanted to be there on purpose yeah. and not the one that was just kind of showing up like kind of accidentally because, yeah. you know, in like a 3D game, like a 3D style game, it's like, okay, well, what do you, like if you want to visualize noise in the environment, are you going to draw like a huge semi-transparent dome? And it's like, oh, I guess you could, but, uh. right. but like, oh, if you have a side scrolling thing, it's like, right. you just paint a circle and it's like, that's how big the noise is. Yeah. <laughs> so we were able to like leverage the opportunities afforded by some of the other conventions that, you know, Ninja had to so, then... So to some degree, the art style actually helped inform some of the, like, ways in which you were able to fulfill those goals. Totally. So, you know, they were working in tandem in that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. So you weren't, yeah. you know, you weren't divorced from your art style mm -hmm. in terms of gameplay. Like, they were supporting it. Oh, yeah, other, fully, right? fully, right? Um, and, like, you know, some of that stuff was, like, just a natural happenstance of experimentation. It wasn't like, ah, oh, if we make this game in two... It was like, oh, Clay has a bunch of artists who do 2D flash yeah. art, so that's right. real making a side-scrolling game. Yeah. And then we're like, oh, but because Understanding that, those constraints. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. And then embracing them rather than trying to, like, Fight you know, them. circumvent them in yeah. some way or whatever. Yeah. Right? Be like, well, other games do this, so we need to, it's like, no, but like, I think this was the, the core learning. And again, largely ascertained in retrospect it was one of like, okay, some other game in a with a different set of constraints might make this choice. Why are they making that? Like, why is that design mechanic system, whatever? It's like, why is it there? Okay. How do we get, how do we achieve that same thing yeah. in, in a context that's appropriate for us being like just straight mimicking what they do? when well, our constraints aren't the same as some other you know 3D stealth game or whatever. So like that is actually not the right choice for us, but the experience that creates is a thing that we want. So how do we get at that experience in our yeah. presentation constraints, mechanics, whatever, right? Um, again, like a thing that we kind of stumbled toward and only in retrospect can you kind of put that pattern to it, but that was like a pretty... I think very valuable insight that I've like tried to carry as much as possible a little bit more deliberately going forward. Right. 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 Like really trying to say, it's like, okay, well, what is specifically, what is the thing we're trying to achieve here? Not just like, it will be fun or like, it will be interesting, but it's like, no, no, no. Like what are the goals? Yeah. And it's like, yeah. what is the, what is the challenge? Right. Is the challenge about like understanding the, the internalizing through repetition the radius of noise it's like no that's not that's not what the game is about okay well why, we don't need that part then we'll just draw a circle on the screen right um so it's like that's as your advice for sort of how you stay focused on on design then is is to really think purely about what the game is and what the game isn't yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. in like ways that are you know as again, it's 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 always messy, right? But like as specific and articulable as possible, yeah. Because there's like 
a ton of decisions that all like are all like reasonable could be fun but it's like okay well ultimately these things all have to fit together Mm -hmm. to create like something that's kind of coherent right Mm -hmm. and if you're able to understand articulate like what that thing is ultimately meant to be then from your like broad smorgasbord of a bunch of like in isolation individually like interesting valid whatever it's like okay but then the, the you know the gestalt of all of these need to fit into this thing. If you understand that thing, it makes that decision making process yeah well, at least easier, um, and ideally, hopefully, the ultimate experience um, more coherent and able to like actually achieve, articulate whatever the thing was meant to be. Versus kind of like it's got a bunch of like interesting individual bits, but they don't really like gel synergy. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so would you say that you, you know, when you, when you then went on to work on, cause you, you basically went from that and then to work on Firewatch, right? Did, or did we, or yep. Do, yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, we did, um, a DLC for Ninja as well. Right. Uh, in classic fashion. Um, but then when that was resolving more or less, uh, you know, some other industry folks I'd connected with who at the time had been at, um, Telltale were the kind of leads on the first season of The Walking Dead, okay. which was like one of the big inflection points for like obviously not the first title that telltale did but one of that one that, that like that was that, it broadened yeah. the number of people who were like oh telltale games whoa that's yeah. a thing right right um so they left they were leaving telltale and okay. i'd known them through various industry things for quite a while and because they were talking about starting something new you know obviously clay was a cool uh, interesting place to work a lot the the team was really great um but you know it was a company, it was an organization, a team, whatever, that already existed, mm-hmm. right? Like, that company can't start again because it already exists, right? right. So, and okay, that, so this was an opportunity to go and like join. Like, from right, minute ground zero. Up, define what the company is. Exactly. Okay. It's like, what is this thing going to be like? What is going through that process going to be like? There aren't that many opportunities to do that, you know? And at the, <laughs> somewhere a monkey's paw curled, I was like, well, I don't have that many things going on in my life at this point, so why not have it be a time to start a brand new thing? Um, that was the case then. Second time, less so, but that's fine. Um, uh, yeah, so, you know, and then Campo Santa, it was my, at the, at the, from the outset, it was, uh, Sean Vanneman and Jake Rodkin, who were the two folks who'd been at Telltale. Ollie Moss, um, originally from the UK, right. who was the art director. He just also known them through maybe like some Walking Dead stuff or something. Um, and then myself, and we were the first four, and then, you know, we gathered a few more people, and then eventually a, a Campo Santo, and then a, and then a Firewatch came out. And... Yeah, so that was more of a, you know, mixed bag of roles then that I think you sort of yeah. were in, yeah, yeah, in yeah. that game, right? But that one probably, was... like, mostly design, yeah, like, gameplay again, programming. Yeah, like, design, programming, implement, like, so much implementation. This, so this was your first Unity game, is that correct? Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, because everything at Hothead was Ron's, you know, scum, maniac mansion-derived custom engine. Clay also had their own custom in-house engine so yeah uh and at the time because we started firewatch in 2014 mm-hmm. yes yes um right <laughs> i mean well. it's still the case like a decade later it's like well it's unity or unreal yeah and especially then unreal was uh, like yeah. that was before unreal was free a lot was yeah, it, yeah just, no, no no yeah that was it was, before it was, it was not free, right? it was not free right i don't even know if they had like a like an indie licensing thing right, or not so right. it was like quite so unity was expensive. basically the choice <laughs> correct it was like well i mean maybe or we could like random open source call up someone in south carolina yeah. north carolina oh carolina and be like hey can we get some license involved it's like or we can just use unity okay i'll just y- unity it is um yeah and so it was, it was you know that transition was like fine relatively elegant yeah. you know it's like once you've once you've used a game engine you've kind of used a lot of it. it was actually weird going from um both the the two custom in-house ones mm-hmm. were like you know ide code centric right they're like yeah. was no visual editor <laughs> at like okay technically there was like a map editor but it was like There's a map tools. editor in the way there was for like starcraft or right. whatever right it There's was like some tools this for artists Exactly. And that's about as far as it yeah, goes. Yeah, but it wasn't like, oh, this is like, you yeah. know, an integrated thing where you're putting components on bespoke. It's like, no, no, no. You can like paint the map and like put a spawn point where it's like a chest will be here and an ogre guy will be here or whatever. But it was like a map editor. So that initial transition was actually kind of weird. I'm like, wait a minute. What, is, what are all these objects? Yeah, that was my experience. I'm just supposed too. to like write the code. What? Yeah. This? What? A component? What's a component? Um, 
And still, there's still like a little bit of a hitch in my brain where I'm just like, oh, that should just be like a main function. And that just like makes the game start, right? Um, but I got habituated, I became used to it. Uh, and you know, it was fine. It was, it was, we made it, made it do what it needed to do. How long did it take to, to make? Two years. Okay. Almost, it was like two years and one month. Okay, so most other games, which <gasps> we'll get into in a minute, most other games have been like two year, two ish year yeah. kind of gigs. Okay, all right. Um, so was it? Would you say there was anything particularly challenging about working on that game then? I mean, honestly, it was like a pretty smooth production. <laughs> really? Why would you? Why, like, what? What was it? Was it the the genre? Was it the the like programming? Like what? The the general design or the what specifically yeah, made think, it so smooth? Which is yeah, I think it was partially like. Uh, I mean, not that there wasn't, you know, not that there was zero experimentation. Right, or whatever. It's game dev, right? Like, yeah, correct, exactly. Um, Everything but, is in a uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the thing that I think facilitated that a lot, it was like it was pretty clear what we were trying to achieve, mm -hmm. and the number of things that we didn't understand, like didn't know, didn't have a lot of like prior reference in terms of games, were like relatively constrained, right? Like, you know, at that point. Gone Home, made it in part by one of our current colleagues, Carla Zamanja. Uh, Gone Home had already come out. Yes. Yes. Um, and I think um, the 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 Chinese Room one, the very first one, the oh, dear spooky. Esther? Yes, there we go. Mm -hmm. That had also existed. So like, okay, like the you know, you're a first person like walking around into space, but there's like no dudes to blast or whatever. It's like that part was known. Right? It's like, okay, well, experience, experientially, we understand what that is. So the only, not the only, but, like, the me the the mechanical, systemic, whatever, thing that was not, we didn't have a clear prior art to point at, was just, like, the conversation tree right. radio dialogue thing, okay. right? Because, like, you know, there had, obviously there had been Telltale games, but, like, those are, you know the whatever the the x number of characters are all like locked in a room you can click on a guy and go through a conversation tree but it's when that's where the exit of that and when that's done is, you yeah. move to the next scene that's it right, right? but if i was like oh you can just turn around like just like walk in the opposite direction and be like hey i'm looking at this tree and the game still needs to function okay. <laughs> so that was like the main mechanical challenge but that thing but that was like kind of the main thing um, so because it was a little bit more constrained in that regard, I think it made the problem solving a little bit easier. And I think obviously it also helped a ton that like all of us had been making games for like quite a while. Right. Um, it was not, it wasn't definitely not anyone's first rodeo. Um, and you know, just like some combination of good fortune, circumstance, expertise, everything just kind of socketed together. Right. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's nice. To hear. Yeah. Huh. What a time that was. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so that's probably a good segue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no! Uh, to talk about starting Generation XR. Uh-huh. Um, which, uh, yeah. Like, do you want to give the overview of that, I guess? Oh, man. Um, so... Because I, I wasn't on this from, the, from the, 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 beginning. the beginning. beginning. I've been on for a while, but I mean, mm -hmm. since I've lived in Vancouver since... Yeah. So I moved here in 2019. End mm -hmm. of 2019. Yeah. And joined... A year after I moved here, mm -hmm. but you were working on it. But Correct. You started it. Yeah. So and like, all things being equal, like the first two years, like technically, kind of, sort of started in two thousand and eighteen. But those first couple of years were like just me and two other people doing like ideation. Yeah, just like very high level prototyping stuff, yeah. and also like figuring out where on earth the actual money to right. make the entire game I did will come from. I did want to touch on that because I think it's probably an interesting topic for people of just like funding yeah. as a whole, right? So. Um, yes. Maybe if you can like lead into yeah. yeah. So the arc, that. the arc there. So obviously the the genesis of the game itself was, you know, I <laughs> not dissimilarly from stealth games like sort of you know like s simulation strategy type building games. I've also always loved. Like I I played the <laughs> the I played the 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 demo of Caesar three that almost certainly came on some PC gamer <laughs> demo disc like. So many times, right? right? right. Um, and there's always, there's always just, there's like just a core satisfaction in those games. But the thing that I'd also then encountered a little bit more uh, contemporaneously to starting the project was the very character-driven simulation stuff, the emergent narrative things that fall out of games like Crusader Kings. Yeah. Um, right. At the time, now you can also point at some other titles like 
Wildermyth and Dream right. World and stuff like that as right. well. And I'm like, okay, well, it feels like there's an opportunity to like put those two things together because CK is awesome, but it also is like very much just derived from like the grand strategy, like Europa Universalis hearts of iron paradox tradition, which is cool, but that's different from yeah. like kind of the more grounded, like city building base management ish right. Right. type things that I always There's, there's really like a much enjoyed. faster loop to those city yeah. building games. Whereas there's a much longer sort of, set something long payoff mm -hmm. strategy yeah games. and and those and like while i mean ck is it's wild you can do kind of whatever you want yeah. like the the fundamentally those games are kind of like they're kind of sort of conquest games kind of yeah. right in the same way like right. you know with with civilization that game ends when either you've won or you've lost yeah right but it's like you don't like win sim city and like technically you may like finish a scenario in mm -hmm. anno or whatever mm -hmm. but it's definitely not like well you need to you know, beat Catherine the Great before she destroys you or whatever, right? And I'm like, okay, well, it feels like there's there's some something there, right? But that isn't as like full on open ended bonker sandbox town yeah. as like Rim World or you know way at the end of the spectrum like Dwarf Fortress or whatever, right? Right? It feels like okay, there's something in here that has that emergent narrative stuff, but is attached to like a slightly different set of like core mechanics, um, and that was just like the 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 inciting idea um and so then we're like okay but you you, you, yeah, you can't make a video game and not pay your rent um so up here in canada through um a technically like arm's length crown corporation uh called telefilm there is this funding program called the the cma for the canadian media fund canada media fund um right and they while it exists primarily to film Right, for those who don't Define. know, Vancouver specifically, and I guess Toronto in some way. And Montreal. A couple of, yeah, two or three of the major Canadian cities are really big film yeah. like yeah. hubs, and so these government programs exist to keep that going yeah. ultimately right? yeah and facilitate like local talent like one right. of the one of the conditions of cmf programs is that you know a certain percentage of it more than half has to be like canadian stuff so it can't just be like oh this is a way that the americans roll up here and then take tax dollars to make their hollywood movies or whatever right um but there is even though the cmf is primarily for film and television productions there is technically like a little substream that is like oh also video games i guess yeah. Um, and it has two stages where you can initially apply apply for like a much smaller like we'll build a prototype amount of money, and then if that's um, if you get approved uh, for that, then once you have a prototype, you can come back to them for like a bigger funding contribution. Okay. Um, the high level is like you know they'll put in seventy five percent of the money of the total budget, and you got to find the other quarter yourself somewhere. Um, so we started out with uh, that prototyping funding from the CMF. I was able to build like. Uh, at least a vaguely representative prototype. Um, and so we, you know, brought that back to the CMF uh, for full production funding, but then also went to GDC and just did the whole, like, publisher funding dance. Yeah. Um, to try to find a partner. And I won't get into the full details, but it ultimately ended up that um, we connected with uh, this organization called Kowloon Knights, which is not, like exactly a publisher they're right. a, they're a, they're a fund so it's like okay they do project based funding and they offer like expertise but it's like primarily just a financial investment it, yeah. it, it isn't like oh and we'll do your marketing and like your localization outreach and we own your blah, blah, blah. ip yeah, yeah it's just like right. we'll give you dollars it's on, kind of a perfect like, scenario really is particularly it's for, like for if you, us if you've done yeah. this before and you yeah. kind of like you have a relatively clear understanding of the process but right. it's like you literally just need the ability to ensure people can like pay their rent and buy groceries yeah. until the game is done it was a pretty ideal setup and they're all like incredibly kind incredibly expert you know expert in their relative domains um and so that ended up being the thing that has funded the full production of the video game. But that, like, just figuring all of that stuff out was, like, kind of the first two years. Yeah. And so it wasn't really until, like, you know, the a, money a bit into, existed. Yeah, exactly. Right. Until a bit into, um, uh, like, basically early 2020. <laughs> um, when, like, we started making the game, like, real Z for real. Why do you laugh? It's not like something big and monumental <laughs> happened in 2020. Um, indeed. Uh, fortunately, <laughs> um, from the outset, 
the team was structured to be entirely remote. Right. Um, right. You know, that, that initial prototyping squad was myself, someone in Eastern Canada, and then someone on the Eastern Seaboard of the U.S., and, you know, as we've grown now, like, even though, as mentioned, there are a few of us here. We also have folks in Montreal, Sao Paulo, Brazil, San Francisco, Nebraska, yeah. uh, Winnipeg. Um, and we are only able to do that because, like, from the jump, the the company was always going to be entirely remote. Because that is how I worked on all of Firewatch. Like, there was, there was like, an, you know, an, an, like an in-person nexus in San Francisco. Because se- se- seven? Seven? Six or seven of the ten people were all in San Francisco. But I was up here. Ollie, uh, the art director, as well as our animator, James, were both in the UK. So, like, we had to get at least, like, a what would now people would call, like, a hybrid setup. But it t- at the back then, it was just kind of like, we have a big TV in the back of the room that is hooked up to the build server that just runs a Zoom call all day. And so when me or the folks in the UK, like start working we just like jump into that persistent zoom call and our giant disembodied right. head You're appears in the on office the big then. tv and it like honestly was like 90 percent as good as being in the office yeah. and so when we were starting um sonder it was like what if we just do that but without the office part mm-hmm. what if everyone's just on a big tv that is in everybody else's living room instead yeah. proverbially um it turned out that was accidentally very wise to do. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely helped. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so yeah, so that and so like honestly, like early twenty twenty ish. Okay, um, is where like okay, we're making this game for real. Yeah, because I mean, I think so. I joined, I joined Loose. I was, of I was tying, I was tying some stuff off on my own personal projects and and I uh, uh, around the end of summer, yeah, yeah. of twenty twenty, and mm-hmm. then I went full time. Um, the start of 21. Right. Um, because that was like the visa, like, mm. yeah. Immigration. Yeah, yeah, immigration yeah, yeah. stuff. So, um, that's mostly, basically what happened is, uh, we met when I first moved here in 2019. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had explained my interest in, uh, yeah, strategy games, etc. Um, and like we were talking about earlier, just kind of stayed in touch. We'd hang mm-hmm. out, we'd go do, we, you know, we'd, we'd meet up every now ended and then. Ended up at the same conference. Yeah. We ended up at the same conference and yeah, just stayed in touch and, um, we're at different, events around the city mm-hmm. or whatever um, and then something came up well with the you know 2020 happened <laughs> and I wanted to stay in Canada um, and so it was literally like hey you know can I come do the thing because it seems like it's a cool project and uh, let's program a video game yeah, yeah. and so that was thankfully the case <laughs> so I appreciate that <laughs> hooray I'm still living in Canada because of this game. we so did it was great <laughs> um, so from there, ultimately, like when I started joining, that was yeah, that was really when it started to become a thing. But then the question is, how has it taken four years to get to announcing the game? Because what we're gonna have, I assume, we're gonna go into early access some point next year. Some point next year. Not sure yet, but at some point next year. Yeah. So we've still got a little bit, a, a, a ways to go. A little yes. bit of time. Yeah. Before we want to, you know, get fully hands on with it. Mm-hmm. So the question really is, what have we been doing in all that time? That's a great question, Matt. <laughs> do you know? <laughs> um, I, I mean, do, but I'd like to hear your. I'd the, like to hear your. Well, um, part of it was, and you know, this also links back to the fact that like those first two years were very light. Is that particularly with like a big systems-driven game yeah. like this, there are so many interlocking pieces. Right. There's no, there's no way to be like, you know, with Ninja, it's like, okay, well we can at least build like, okay, your little guy moves across the screen and you like jump and grab into a wall and then jump over to this other point. It's like, okay, well at least like five seconds of playing the game, like feel satisfying and interesting. And in like a big systems oriented strategy game, you don't get that like five seconds of game until you built 90% of the game. Right? Like, the version of Civ that only has the tech tree in it and nothing else, it's not that it's like, oh, well, I can see the... It's like, there's that's just nothing. Mm-hmm. That's not even like a game. That's just nothing. Yeah. Right? So you have to keep building up so many different interlocking systems until finally there's, like, this critical mass of stuff that you can look at and go, like, oh, okay, I get how all the bits can fit together now. Yeah. Particularly when, you know, in a, in our case for bo- for both both Boone and Bane, um there isn't really like a clear reference point. Right. Right. That's like, always been the challenge for us. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've talked to Soren Johnson, um who was the lead designer on uh Civ 4 
uh, and now runs his own studio, Mohawk. They shipped Off World Trading Company and then Old World. Is that like, he's like, oh yeah, Old World is just, I, I'm just fixing all the stuff I wanted to fix in Civ. <laughs> and it's like, and obviously that doesn't like denigrate how incredibly complicated all that work is and like the innovation there, but it like, at least there's a much clearer like starting reference yeah. point. And it's like, sequels are often faster to make for, right? especially uh, maybe not bigger studios, but like smaller studios because you can just build on the, the knowledge that you gain mm-hmm. throughout that whole process or DLC, right? Like yeah. you can turn DLC out because you're building on the game that's finished yeah and you understand like okay well what yeah. just what is this goddamn game um and so both like to our advantage but also disadvantage it's like yeah. well it's kind of this like weird chimera of like several different other things yeah but it's not just like oh it's x but we changed y yeah i mean i think my my kind of general um concept of what we've been doing for the past <laughs> four years outside of like it feels like we've built the game over and over but mm-hmm. ultimately we've actually just been bringing that cone of like what the game is mm-hmm. smaller and smaller to yeah, where yeah, we, yeah. Where we yeah. kindly, finally are but part of that is like you said because it's such a systems driven game that we've been building ultimately just a lot of architecture and tooling for those all those systems to mm-hmm. exist yeah. um, you know f- f- uh followers of the channel will be aware of <laughs> many of the videos I've made that are just about tooling and systems and like some of that has come from um, working on uh, Generation Exile because it has been a lot of interesting things interesting problems that we've had to solve and build tools for totally. that uh, enable um, content to be built so like one of the concepts for this game is that uh, we we get features in, but then developing content is rapid and fast. And actually, one of the things that we were talking to our artist um, PO about is purely that, that his whole design for the art direction has been to be able to rapidly build. Mm-hmm. You know, gorgeous, but very. Yeah. It's been purely designed in a way that means that he he can build stuff real build quick. Build a lot of it because yeah. a lot of it is just him, mm-hmm. right? Oh and yeah. So you know, um, it's it's been incredible about the way he can turn all of that stuff around. And so it's the same thing ultimately with the way that we design the architecture. There are probably if you look at our game, there's probably a multitude of different routes we could have taken to get it to where it is, mm-hmm. but we've had to build it in a way that means that we can get the content out quickly yeah. for a, small, a smaller team to work on, right? Yeah, so I think yeah, yeah. probably something worth might be worth touching on is, is really that of like the, the difference of d- design approach that you have to take when you're working with such a small, limited amount of resources, right? Yeah, and, you know, somewhat um, commensurate with the way that the project started in general, like we del- very deliberately kept the head count of folks like yeah. really low for yeah. a really long time. Yeah. Right. Like would hypothetically the game being early access now, if we just had like 10 people from like the first minute, it's like maybe, or maybe we would have just like spent the entire budget and still not really understood what we were making and either had to find more dollars, which would be very difficult or just like, there would there'd be something that just like isn't that doesn't fit together that well right? right so part of the trade-off of like time expended was keeping the number of people really low so that we could really figure out like answer okay, the questions we yeah, need to what answer. is this stuff right because one of the like big dependency challenges is like people need stuff to do <laughs> yeah. right but when you're like well I can't provide a list of like 30 little city building structures to make because we don't know how the like core need population satisfaction whatever systems are going to work yet. Yeah. The person's like, well, but I need stuff to do. And so yeah. then either you, you know, just like come up with something hasty that gets thrown away or you're forced to commit to something that mechanically isn't like actually working, but it's like, well, that's the thing we built. So I guess we're going to stick with it. And obviously whatever, like, Ultimately, things just kind of have to ship. Like, you can try to make something perfect forever and you will just go insane or right. become a skeleton. <laughs> um, but also, I think, like, a lot of projects have either been doomed and just never seen the light of day or come out and were just, like, didn't fit together that well because they just, like, had to keep feeding work to people. Right. Um, you got to keep the lights on for everybody. Yeah. Because you've made that, you've got, yeah, you yeah. know, yeah. yeah. If it's like a team that's already established and then this is the second game you're working on, mm-hmm. you have to then get that through. Whereas as a startup, exactly. ultimately you have that flexibility yeah, yeah. to keep it small at the beginning. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so while there's 10 of us now, yeah. like I think five of there those were, people showed up in the last year. Yeah. That's, right. Yeah, and that definitely. like was not an accident, No, but you know, even then, this game is very, perhaps too ambitious for a team of 10 people to make. And it's like, and what if half of those people, and it's like, right, takes a long time to make some stuff. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of it too, you were talking about like not making stuff to throw away, but half the time we were making a lot of things that we were like, that's that's definitely the approach that I, you know, 
show people on the channel with with a lot of the content is that like I'm often just making things in a way that's like let's get it to, oh yeah to a point that is just like proving the concept yep. right yep, 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 just, yep. because conceptually a design is only good when you can test it mm -hmm. right and like iterate on it yeah, yeah, yeah sometimes you can have the greatest idea for a design you know, on paper. In your mind palace. Right. But until, <laughs> until you start putting it together, you're just like, oh no, this actually sucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, you know, it's trying to meet that minimum um, viable product of, of an idea mm -hmm. to get it to answer the questions that you need to answer. Mm -hmm. And no more, yeah. often no less. Yeah, right? totally, right? Um, yeah, I think there's a difference between like doing that intentionally and just like, oh, the character modeler has nothing to model, so I guess we just need to give them something. But that's not like intentional, let's rapidly build a thing to get some information. That's just kind of like, oh God, we just have to like keep putting stuff on this person's plate because otherwise they'll be very sad yeah. or whatever, right? Um, yeah, so I, that is definitely a, you know, I'm, I'm always an enthusiastically in favor of like, build a simple thing just to give you some information and then throw it away. Uh, once you got that information until you know actually what you need to know to like build a thing for real, see real, right? Yeah. And so, okay. So on that note, what would you say just, you know, out of interest and I think a little bit as a tease for the game, maybe, um, what would you say is some, like some of the interesting things that we've, we've discovered in that process, mm. right? For you that maybe you didn't think of originally that having the team and us iterating on things has answered for you that maybe weren't in the original kind of concept for the game or like you know anything that's in it now that we sort of got to through that oh process man, that's a good question i mean it sounds very simple but like the initial concept of the game didn't have a map <laughs> <laughs> so like oh right it's kind of hard to have a city builder if if you aren't building a, 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 so a it? city it was like just pure interface and data okay. there's still like visualization um but the, the presentation itself was kind of akin to, um, there's this uh, series of, again, like settlement management strategy games, whatever, um, that the series began with King of Dragon Pass and moved on to a series of follow-ups uh, called Six Ages, where they're like, you know, they're like a robust settlement type management game, but you're not like putting little structures down. It's more abstracted than that. And initially it was like, oh, okay. And those games, you know, have very like, weirdly unexpected kind of emergent stories. It's like, okay, maybe there's something here, but that initial concept just didn't, it was too intangible. It was just kind of like, I don't really have a sense of like the presence of this place, mm -hmm. right? Where it's like, okay, we, we got these, you know, like little like vignette, almost like you're looking through security cameras or whatever, but it just felt like too amorphous and having something like tangible, not just like, whatever, experientially, aesthetically, but, like, in terms of an actual, like, board game piece where it's like, okay, well, we have some notion of, like, spatiality, right? So it's like, okay, well, this sounds obvious. It's like, why does a strategy game have a map? Turns out. Um, but the thing that that afforded was the ability to, and this is the thing, another thing I think we discovered, is, like, lean more into the, like, emergent properties or whatever of like doing that city building stuff as well as the having emergent reactive things like in the you know narrative event yeah i want to talk about story la yeah, layer I as well bring that up in a minute right i think that's an interesting thing to talk about but i think that was the yeah. thing where it's like you know whatever it's it sounds very obvious in retrospect but a genuine thing it's like oh no right there there's you can kind of like not oversimplify but but like sometimes shave things down a little bit too much. Right. Like sand, um, sand the edges off too far. It was sand the edges off yeah. or just like you just don't you just don't have enough stuff in the okay. game. Yeah, yeah. Right? When it's just like when it's just like yeah sure you can give a bunch of different like stats and labels to yeah. a thing but it, it really does become like when that all doesn't have Oh like, like a tactile do you mean like a tactile element? Yeah like tactile and also just like more of more of um I don't know, better way to say it's like a place where that stuff lives, right? When it's all just like numbers and data in the UI, right? Which is like fine, obviously, but then you have something that looks kind of like, you know, like um, 
Cliff Harris's democracy series yep. or whatever, where, where it's like, it's all just sliders and numbers. And it's like, if you want to do that, that's okay. But to make that compelling, you need like that's your a commitment. million of those things. And right. that's the entire video game, yeah. right? And we're like, well, no, it's going to be very important to have this like character agent driven story component. But that sits pretty uncomfortably alongside just like, well, here's a ton of numbers and data. Yeah. But by putting like, oh, well, what if there's, again, it sounds very obvious in retrospect, but like, what if there's a map? It's like, oh, okay, you know, when people need more places to live or whatever, well, how many little buildings that provide housing are there on the map? And it's like, okay, well, that's just a place where that lives now, And right? it's tying into the story elements. Exactly, and, and so yeah. it becomes a little bit more just like easier for the person playing the video game to like build a mental model right. of what everything is. Um, and then we can continue to like, leverage the properties that that spatiality or whatever affords more to then reinforce like the other stuff in the game that's meant to be you know interesting evocative compelling whatever cool okay and so yeah i mean you, you brought up like the the emergent narrative aspect of it i think there's some interesting stuff technically that we've been doing that mm. that might be worth talking about yeah, so, yeah. Uh, do you want to elaborate on that a little bit oh man uh, where do we start with that because um, that mean, was the challenge right that's one of the things that I did first when, mm -hmm. when we when I came onto it was yeah, yeah, solving yeah. that problem really yeah. that was like the big key thing that we were trying mm -hmm. to get around yeah there's an interesting lineage here where you can maybe talk about the tooling that we've yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, with Firewatch, right. uh, the you know that game is is very very stateful in terms of like all the lines of dialogue and everything, right? Um, where you know whether you say X versus Y is obviously a combination of like factors of what you're seeing on the screen, what the reticle is pointing at, but also like a bunch of game state stuff that may have happened and been recorded, but just kind of like invisibly. Um, that itself was derived from this great uh, talk that Elon Rushkin, who used to be at Valve, did about how they did all their like context aware reactive barks for left for dead and so while that was just like you know auto automatically triggered by the system barks for in left for dead we're like okay well what if that was like player triggered and that was like okay that's firewatch and i'm like well what if that was broadened out to not just be like lines of dialogue but actually like specific narrative events um in a way that at the time didn't really exist and then part of the way through us working on this we're like oh that, that's a few what, other games that's that, what yeah. wildermyth is doing that's cool hell yeah nice yeah. um obviously in a very different context uh and so yeah one of the very first things that you were helping us out with was like how do we manage like the statefulness of all of this because <laughs> the left 4 dead version was using a fox pro database <laughs> Um, we built a custom bunch of custom tools uh, in Unity for Firewatch, but uh, at its root, that was always just about like triggering different lines of dialogue. I mean, it could do other stuff, but yeah. like that game was very much like ultimately dialogue centric, right? We're like, okay, well, we want an even broader set of tools. Oh, what is that? What does that look like? <laughs> and that ultimately uh, is what we what you very cleverly named cardboard. Um, and which blackboard. Is, and blackboard. Yeah. Uh, the boards. The boards. The board twins. Um, uh, fraternal, not identical. Um, they, and those, it's like, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like half a visual scripting system. Right. And like half a finite state machine. Yeah. I guess. And half a database. Yeah. Like a, yeah Basically, like you've built all of Unreal's like <laughs> blueprint system again in Unity. So well done, Matt. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there is some stuff on the. Uh, I did two live streams earlier in January for anybody watching to like learn how the editing tools work for visual scripting, like Unity Graph View. Um, there's two. I'll link them below. There's two things on that, but it was directly inspired by some of the work we did here. But yeah, um, yeah. I mean, the challenge was right. We're trying to solve this problem of how do we pull in a bunch of dialogue, but also expose this to artists and editors and designers, right? And mm -hmm. so a lot of the gameplay itself is actually being handled it through cardboard. Mm -hmm. But it is less, I would say it's less like um, blueprints in that it's very specifically tied to game, our game's game logic, right? In that yeah. like all with the nodes that yeah, we yeah, create yeah. are like, do this specific game state yeah, thing yeah, yeah. and do this specific game state right. thing. Like put, so. put this trait on the, the right. characters in this list who are yeah. all in this scene and all saw the same weird thing. thing. So now they all remember, oh, hey, remember when we saw that thing pop out of the ground or yeah. whatever, right? Yeah, or like um, when these buildings all get put together. So it's a lot of the, the gameplay logic from a sense of data management mm. because like we were talking about, it's a lot of trying to create these systems that are iterative right in that 
um, and very fast to change versus, you know, if a programmer has to do that in code, mm -hmm. then it's like, okay, that's now a blocker until a programmer has some time available to make those changes yeah. versus working on a tooling system like this, the design team, the art team, the narrative team all have access to these tools. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll try and put up some screen, like some vi visuals here of like what that looks like. I yeah. think. Um, and, you know, can add new nodes and can change the flow, can test things in the game, not quite get what they want. They can then like make new nodes and, and just experiment with all these different outcomes and you know my design, my process behind this was always also i think a greater than the sum of its parts situation whereby mm -hmm. just giving all these modules to people yep. to play with their creativity will allow it to do things yeah. that i hadn't thought of or yeah, we yeah. hadn't thought of when yeah. we were designing it because yeah. I, I i i staunchly believe that the best quality work results in the people who are like doing the work can be like as close to just getting it into the video game as possible. Yeah. Right. Right. As if fast it's like, as possible. I'm going to write a spec and hand it to a programmer and then they're going to triage their various tasks. Eventually they'll get to it and say, Hey, look at build number 476. I checked in the thing. And then the person has yeah. to like triage through their own tasks, evaluate the thing in the build. And they're like, Oh, actually it's not quite what I meant. Send the note. That's just like, yeah. Oh my God, that sucks. Like the, when I was just like, you know, in, uh, working on Ninja, for example, like all the all the character um, actual like movement stuff, it was all done via Lua scripting. But it was just could be just like live recompiled or like, so hot, be like hot reload. Yeah, just nice. change some stuff, load it, jump back and just like do something else on the level and be like, ah, it's not quite right. Do it yeah. and like it's just like tweaking ability, dials ultimately. Yeah, and right, that ability yeah. to be able to like very quickly iterate is so valuable. And so it's like you know when the folks on our narrative team can just like they're like, I want. Actually, it'd be really cool if this uh, this trait we just invented for the other story lit. Oh, well, that could just go on the people in this story lit as well. They can just open up the editor and do that. Yeah. That's not like oh, create a task in the in the ticket management system and assign it to this part. They can just do that. Yeah. Um. And for a team of our size, yeah, working on something this complicated, yeah. like that is the only way any of this even has a chance of working. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. No. It's 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 definitely you know we could do another whole other video i think on on just which maybe we'll do later when we're you know closer to launch yeah um doing more of post-mortems of some of the stuff i think that would be interesting to go through and mm -hmm. maybe look at our tooling and and like um yeah talk about that i think no yeah uh that's for me that's definitely the standout on this project is just working on some of those tools i mean i'm a tools guy right <laughs> like that's that's been the coolest thing about this and um yeah when when it gets I think, you know, we're not sure where we're sitting on mods yet, but part of the thing, part of the process of designing some of these tools has also been to make it mod friendly, right? Like, mm -hmm. as possible. Yeah. Um, no commitments there from us, but like, you know, we're trying to do the most we can to mm -hmm. um, not make it hard on ourselves. Right? Exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, totally. But, but for the same reasons, like having these function, you know, this, this tool that people can use kind of in like a creation kit-esque yeah. mentality, right? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Maybe that'll be useful, but who yeah. knows? We're like... Can't commit to anything like that yet, yeah, yeah. but maybe in the future, like for sure. this guy. Um, yeah. yeah. So um, we've got six months. Well, you know, well, tw whatever. We've got a bunch of time, 12 months, however long yeah. until we are thinking about getting into early access. So what, you know, what do we have to do now? Um, and watch, you know, if people are interested in the game, oh man, like we're, we're going to still want to be talking about it. Right. So <laughs> yeah, I know. We just got to yeah. make the rest of the video game. We are recording this before we've announced it. Correct. We're watching this after we've announced it. Uh, it's either gone great or we're all very sad. Um, let us know. Let us know in the comments if you think the game looks cool. Yes. I think that'll be useful too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it, no, this is like, this is one of the challenges when it comes to like finally talking about the game. It's like, there's so much of both what it is and what it was that's just yeah. like, just this, like, just this hive of concept in your brain and so having to take all of that and condense it down into something that's just like relatively ideally understandable by somebody else is always yeah. a, a, a very interesting but also like challenging exercise and so i've always had a lot of satisfaction after the fact of like seeing like okay what did we what did we think we were articulating about it right. what did people pick up from it and then well, yeah. that can be like very positively surprising, but also like a, oh yeah, moment sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. I think that's that's definitely the thing because like right now we don't know what people think the game is. Mm -hmm. We know what we think the game is. Correct. But as soon as it goes out into the public, 
Yeah, yeah. the game is what people think the game correct. is. Correct, <laughs> correct. And it's our job to make sure that there's not too much of a shear between those things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tim Kaine did a video recently about that, actually, mm, on mm. talking about like player expectations and stuff and mm. expectation management. Incredible. And that's the best thing you can do when you're announcing a game. So um, what would you say to people that maybe have game, like, you know, might have questions here on why did we pick PC Gamer and the PC Gaming Show? Again, I'll link, if you haven't seen the like full announcement thing, I'll, I'll link it down below. But why did we wait? For that why didn't we talk about it earlier you know what was your decision there i think just before we you know we close out for this yeah yeah i mean there there is again uh a bit of a tension between you know you want to begin discussing your game like not hey surprise it's coming out in a week like whatever occasionally someone can pull that off that's I worked for high fire rush kind of <laughs> 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 um uh but there is, you know, the, the other side of that coin of like, okay, well, you want to announce it as early as possible and start talking about it. Like, when you don't even know what it is, then being able to articulate that to somebody else, like, becomes a lot more challenging, yeah. right? So there was this sort of teeter-totter between, like, okay, well, when... When's it ready? Yeah, and not, like, ready as in, like, it's perfect and final and done. I'm like, you know, we are going to be launching the game in early, into early access because specifically we know that we're not going to be able to figure out like everything about this that people are like connecting with or like resonant with or like some of our assumptions can only be tested by people actually experiencing the game and like helping build it with us right but you still at least for for us it was important to be like okay well we we have enough of an understanding that we can articulate what this is about and then move deliberately in that direction, in coordination with other folks. And so given that, it's like, okay, then are there opportunities for us to be able to, like, let as many people know about it as right. as possible? Because um, that's the other, the other challenge is, like, people are like, oh, so many games come out on Steam. And it's like, yeah, well, on the one hand, that's kind of true. Like, a lot of those are, like, very small hobbyist things that are not like, okay, this isn't a thing that is fingers crossed going to be like housing cl housing clothing and feeding like 10 people right um right. so that number has held like relatively constant but what is true is that like yeah but there's that number of games that have come out for like the past 10 years and it's not like a console where like okay sure there might be one generation of backwards compatibility whatever but like when the next iteration of a console comes out you kind of sort of wipe the slate a yeah. bit yeah. but with PC one of the awesome things about it is like oh you just get more and more games one of the downsides is someone who's attempting to make their living from doing that is like oh right there's all those games that people already uh, have <laughs> yep <laughs> um, trying not to think about my Steam back catalog it's fine <laughs> um so just like that challenge of just like letting people know your title right. exists and being able to be articulate about like well, what about it is like compelling and different and interesting. That was the the, you know, the teeter totter that stuff was pivoting on. And I think the point we're at now is that I hope we're able to communicate like what this thing is meant to achieve and how it's meant to be distinct. Um, but it isn't, you know, like done or so firmly settled that there is an opportunity to keep iterating and like building yeah. it in community as well right yeah i mean i think it, by the genre it is one that i think will once we you know hit on the many features that we want to get at that point like i said it's content which means we should be able to deliver that reasonably mm -hmm. you know in a reasonable amount of time yeah. if, if everything else is there and, and yeah. work on that but mm -hmm. yeah yeah i fully agree and leaving space to be surprised, right? Because there yeah. might be some things where it's like, oh, you know, we imagine that this, like, subsystem or feature or whatever, it's like, okay, well, it's going to be like, you know, it's it, it plays like kind of a supporting yeah. role, right? It's like, it's a little bit over here, but it's not, you know, a major you know, uh, percentage of, like, player attention or whatever, yeah. right? But then, oh, no, a lot of people are actually resonating with this thing. That's one of we the... put our time into That's that. one of the things that's really cool about Early Access. You're like, oh, we, we didn't expect this would really land with people, but actually it is. Okay, cool. Well, let's expand that a bit right. more, or the inverse, right? Where it's like, oh, okay, we're anticipating this feature. Like, okay, we're gonna have about this much, but then through the course of the access, we get this big. Yeah. And then as people start to play, we're like, oh, actually, this is as big as it needs to be. Right. Cool. Okay. Well, we can put that time toward like other stuff instead, right? Yeah. Um, but the only way you know the truth of any of that is just like 
Put it in the hands of actual people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, playtesting only gets you so far. Correct. And only answers certain types of questions, yeah, yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, similarly, then, on that note, like, how did the PC gamer thing come around? And obviously, you know, it, it, would you say that that has come from what we've kind of been talking about, where it's just sort of connections that you've had over the years, reaching out to the people that you've known, or, like, was there something bigger y there? Yeah, essentially there. I mean, I think it was that, you know, we were able to be articulate about what the game was meant to achieve, um, what's distinctive about it. Like, thankfully, blessings upon all the art folks. Like, the game has a look that's distinctive. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't just have the kind of, like, gray, brown, flat appearance that, like, whatever, sometimes you gotta call a spade a spade. The way that a lot of games sometimes of this ilk do. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks distinctive, and that's always uh, a thing that has, like, immediate interest and appeal, right? And, like, you know, a, a, a decision that was not made by accident. Um, so that, and I think we were able to be articulate about like what was compelling about the game. And, you know, since the, we have worked on things in the past that were distinctive and interesting that I think that gives us, you know, a little bit like not credit, but like, there's a little bit of like earned trust there that like, oh, okay, th this is not just like a overinflated promise that like, uh, they might actually be able to, like, land some of the stuff that they're aiming at. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, that is what I'm imagining other people might believe. <laughs> I'm, hmm, who knows? That's, it's fine. We'll get there. Um, but I think, yeah, it was, it was that concert of, right. of um, being able to articulate what about it was distinct and actually be able to, like, present that as well. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And luckily it paid off. Yeah. I mean, it's luck, too. There's, like, an aspect. Oh, yeah. It. It's, it's like, too. yeah, everything is just, yeah. like, circumstance and good fortune. And like, right time, and right place the, Yeah, the best yeah. you can do is just, like... Reach out. Yeah, and create... And, like, set yourself up to then be able to take advantage of good fortune. Yep. I right? always think that. It's, like, if you see a door that's open, run through it. You yeah, know? Like, correct. But, but be, a, be like, your, the job is being observant in a way that, like, is identifying which doors you can run through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, I think that's, that's always been something that I've considered about the game. And that's kind of what works in the games industry mm -hmm. is, like identifying open doors and just going for it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, um, I think it's probably a good sort of space to end on there. Um, is there anything sort of else you want to say to anybody about the game or just like about getting in the industry, like working in the industry or anything um, else? No, I mean, I think the main thing really is, uh, you know, the most valuable thing that anybody can do. Like, I think folks are profoundly aware that time's very tough to be making video games right now. And there's a lot of like deep inequity, particularly in, amongst like larger organizations uh, or organizations that have been embraced. Um, and if folks want their to like supporting small people who, you know, are just trying to do something novel and interesting and like do right by the people who are working on the game, like the most valuable things people can do is like support those smaller projects and for a game that's gonna be coming on a computer, the single most thing you can do is just like hit that add to wish list button right. on Steam. So <laughs> that would be great. There'll be a link around here to click on. Um, but for people who you know are interested uh, from a like industry, one of the lights just went out. Oh, there we go. Good that, that, That's that's yeah. a sign. Um, uh, from an industry perspective, I think the thing that I've really thought about a lot over the last while is like cultivating a sense of curiosity is like one of the most valuable things you can do. Agreed. Of just like, you know, trying to set like ego, there's a difference between like ego and confidence, right? Like it's important to like have some sense of self assuredness but it is really easy for that to accidentally tip too far in one direction or the other. And just like always be curious and questioning and open and just being like, what can, for, for almost any experience, professionally making games or whatever, it's like, it's like thinking about like, what can I learn from this? Yeah. And that, attitude and how can i help how can i help other people yeah, 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 yeah learn like not even learn but like how can i help other people do their job to the best of their ability totally you know like where can i fit in in that and i mm -hmm. think because that's probably what our, our, i would say our studio culture is mm -hmm. it's like how do we help each other make the best game possible yeah right with the limited resources we yeah, have. yeah yeah exactly exactly 
Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much, Nels, for thank you, buddy. doing this Great conversation. With yeah. you. And thank you for helping make this video game. Uh, it genuinely welcome. would be impossible to do it without you. Uh, I, I'm I grateful I every didn't day. force him to say that. No, <laughs> that's all me, but I mean it. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, yeah, so if you do want to, you know, check the game out, I mean, I'm going to, I'm sure there'll be some stuff on the channel. And now I can actually talk about tutorial stuff that comes directly yeah. from the game and mention it by yeah. name, which will be cool. Yeah. Um, um, obviously, it would be great to hear, like, things that people are curious about, interested in, what, it, like, it, this is a thing that I, is genuinely, like, very um, s satisfying for us, like, hearing that kind of stuff from people, so anything. Yeah, yeah, if you have any questions or anything, leave them down below. We may do this, another one of these sort of towards the end. Yeah. Like, um, and if you would like to see me do this with, you know, there are other colleagues, peers in the games industry living in Vancouver, so, and any other opportunities. So if you like this kind of thing, um, let me know that in, yeah. the, in the comment section below as well, yeah. because I would happily do this again. I'm sure there's a couple of people that would be willing to come do this with yeah, uh, us. Awesome. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for watching. Um, and uh, if you enjoyed it, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more videos from us. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for watching. See you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>